So thank you for coming back to this, the second day of this workshop on spiritual bypassing and Buddhism. So for those who weren't here yesterday, my name is Bhante Akaliko. I use he, him pronouns. And today I'm coming to you from Lokanta Bahara, the monastery at the end of the world here on Baramadigal land, Darug Nation in Harris Park, Sydney, Australia. So this land is Baramadigal land, always was, always will be Baramadigal land. And I just like to acknowledge that this land has never been ceded and that I pay my respects to the caretakers of this land um, from past, present and future. And I also extend that respect to any First Nations person who's joining us today. So uh, thank you for being here. I'm not quite organized, but I think all I need to do really is just resort to using my slides again so that I can hide away. So one of the weird things for, for me since the pandemic started is having to do a talk, not really looking at anyone, but just um, seeing my own uh, image. And I think that's why I started using slides so I could kind of distract everyone and focus on something else, not me. So this is why I've gone this direction and I hope you're happy to come with me through this journey of memes and ideas on spiritual bypassing. So I just thought we'd quickly recap what we did yesterday. So we started off with exaggerated detachment. So this idea that you're an island, that you don't need anyone else, that nothing bothers you, that you are a solitary hermit. And we looked at things like emotional numbing and repression, where we hide emotions from ourselves by consciously or unconsciously um, numbing ourselves. Uh, I didn't mention yesterday, actually, I thought I should mention that often one way that we uh, numb ourselves and, and repress is, is through alcohol and drugs or any other form of addictive behavior like pornography um, or any kind of uh, process addiction. And uh, so sometimes we can actually have a spiritual dimension to those things that uh, is part of that spiritual bypass. We also looked at hyper positivity, love and light, good vibes only, being happy all the time. <laughs> No so-called negative emotions, i.e. no reality. <laughs> and we also looked at anger phobia. So this kind of conflict avoidant type of um, personality or uh, performance. We looked at blind, tolerant compassion. And we also looked at weak boundaries. And... I'll just stop sharing there because I think yesterday, I mean, there was quite a lot, wasn't it? There's quite a lot of information there that we got yesterday and um, some of it might feel a little bit abstract. So I thought I'd start today just by describing one situation where all of those things kind of come came together in my experience. And I was just chatting with Bhante Sujato about this today that I remember being on retreat once um, when... There was, uh, I was sitting on the, the platform. It wasn't my retreat. It was a retreat that I was running, uh, that I was um, doing with a, another senior monastic. And so they were sitting on the platform next to me. I was sitting on the platform two, looking out to the people in front of us. And there's a woman sitting in the front row on this meditation retreat, and she's listening to music. And I thought, hmm, should I say something? I thought, surely it's disturbing people all around. So I kind of like, you know, you kind of sneak your eyes open and look and you can see people are like vi visually um, angry and annoyed and kind of like passive aggressively kind of like, <clears throat> you know, trying to make, make this person notice. But of course, you know, she was listening to music. so She wasn't going to hear. 
And you could see people's body language and you could see people uh, really struggling with how to approach this. And the reason why it was so difficult for me, for the people in the room, was because of the container of that space, which is a spiritual space. So you see what happens when we start to put labels and um, we start to think about the spiritual context. It changes how we behave, it changes how we act in those spaces. Because we go to these spaces and suddenly we need to be spiritual. And you might remember that meme that I used yesterday of, uh, is it Dr. Evil saying, oh, you're so spiritual. So we have to be careful about just being spiritual only in spiritual situations or spiritual places, right? So we need to be authentically spiritual wherever we are. But there's something, that's, you know, a bit, it's a bit hard to be spiritual everywhere, isn't it? Because our version of what is spiritual is usually this high idealized level of spirituality where we're perfect, where we're perfectly detached from the affairs of the world, where we can tolerate people's behavior because we're so full of compassion, where things don't affect us. And so what happened in this space was no one said anything. <laughs> I didn't say anything. The people around her didn't say anything. Uh, the senior monastic, when I spoke to them later, I said, did you hear the music that was happening? Should we say something about that? And he's like, oh, you can't control people. So this is like this kind of like, um, you know, it's, it's impossible to change the world. And I think the people in the meditation hall thought, well, this is just my retreat now. This is what I'm gonna have to do with my retreat, which maybe is fine, I guess. But there's so few opportunities in the world to have a retreat, a quiet space. And, you know, this person obviously took the precepts at the beginning of the retreat, which kind of, in, which asked people to refrain from entertainment. And so it was one of those things where you could see how the spiritual container led to a kind of spiritual bypass. Like if you're anywhere else and you're in a room with people and someone had their music playing loudly or uh, was doing something that was going to disturb the rest of the group, then you'd say something, yeah? But because suddenly we're in a spiritual place, a spiritual zone, it was like this forbidden thing. Just trying to share, there we go. So in, in that one example, we have this exaggerated detachment, you know, the person involved was an island. You know, she didn't care about everyone else. She didn't see herself as part of the community, as part of that group. She just saw herself alone in that space. She could do whatever she wanted. And the people around her too were being exaggeratedly detached. I'm not going to let this affect me. This, I'm not troubled by the things of the world. I'm equanimous with everything, even though actually they weren't. They were irritated, they were annoyed, they were angry, they were put off, they were bothered. And what did they do? They used emotional numbing and repression to pretend that it wasn't bothering them, that they were doing some sort of spiritual work, which on one level is true, of course they were, but on another level, they might have been denying their authentic uh, feelings. And this is because of this hyper positivity idea, you know, as a good person, as a spiritual person, as a Buddhist person, we, we can't be negative and a downer. We can't be like a killjoy. We have to be positive all the time. And this affects the way we perceive ourselves and the way we perceive situations. Also, we don't want to bring any conflict into the room. So there's a fear of this kind of like, are we getting angry? Anger is, anger is bad, so I shouldn't be bad. I shouldn't have that mind state. Um, I, I should avoid conflict. I'm just going to have to pretend everything's okay. And we see also this kind of blind compassion. So we focus on this one person. So she's causing 
um, a disturbance, but we should feel compassion for her. She doesn't know what she does. She doesn't see how much harm she's creating in this moment for herself and for others. And we, we do this kind of performance of compassion. And, but it's not a, a compassion with, with wisdom because all these other people in the room also matter. Their meditation retreat also matters, but where was the compassion for them? And also weak boundaries. We have these, you know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't put up any boundaries. Like I should just accept whatever comes. Other people can do whatever they want. It doesn't affect me. Um, this is that kind of thing where people overstep uh, healthy boundaries and become oppressive or uh, they, they do something which affects us and we don't say no. So can you see how that is spiritual bypassing? Does that make sense to you? That we use this spirituality as a, uh, as a means to try to understand our reality in that context. And we use these teachings, we misuse these teachings that we've heard or absorbed, and we um, misapply them, we misconstrue them. And I was reminded of a passage from the suttas where the Buddha had a similar kind of experience, not quite the same, but similar, where he was trying to sit in meditation. And there was a group of, a, a large group of young monks and they were noisy and they were really noisy actually and they were so noisy that the buddha was bothered by it and which is good to know right he complained to the people who were looking after the monks and said what's going on they're so loud it's like they're a bunch of like um fisher people from the from the village what's what's happening here why are they behaving like this and they told them to be quiet and they didn't, they weren't quiet. And so, I mean, how naughty is that? Like not only were they loud and annoying everyone, but they didn't even listen to the Buddha. And then uh, what the Buddha did was he got up and left, you know, and the Buddha getting up and leaving is a, a big sign that something has gone wrong. But he didn't just sit there and pretend that it wasn't happening. He didn't just sit there and bite his tongue. He said, this is a problem. He was aware of the purpose of people being there. They're trying to meditate. And he tried to make an action happen, ask them to be quiet. And when it didn't happen, he removed himself from the situation. So slightly different approach. And, and you often see that in, in the Buddhist texts, when we take the time to read them, we see that the Buddha wasn't this passive walkover. He was someone who had very strong boundaries. He was someone who criticized when he thought there was reason to criticize. He didn't just take this kind of, um, uh, he, he didn't take an approach where he, he, he didn't uh, avoid conflict. He would, he would speak up. He would say, oh, I don't agree with that, or this isn't how I see it, or this is unpraiseworthy. You shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. And, but then you compare that to how we're kind of trained in spiritual communities today, or the feelings that we, we kind of get when we go to a retreat center or a monastery or a temple. And the culture there is quite different. We're kind of like, oh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't make a fast. You shouldn't be this, you shouldn't do that. You should never say this, you should never do that. And sometimes it's quite different from the kind of authentic real world that you get from the, the Buddhist teachings. And I sometimes just wonder how this happened, that we kind of created this very different culture and that we created this very artificial and maybe slightly brittle, maybe a little bit like a hothouse environment where we separated our spirituality from the way we behave in the rest of the world. And we created this artificial environment where only this place we are spiritual. Um, only this place do we do this kind of performance of spirituality. And then the rest of the world, we might not give it the same attention. We might not 
uh, think of uh, applying our spirituality in the same way in different contexts. And that's, in a way, that's a problem because it means that we don't integrate our spiritual practice into our life and we don't uh, bring our other life into our spiritual practice. They're separate. They're not resolved. They're not authentically integrated. And this is when spiritual bypassing occurs. And so what we're looking at um, in the rest of this session is really around that, um, that gap between reality and our fantasized version of reality, of spiritual practice. And so today we're going to be looking at lopsided development, so especially the cognitive over the emotional. We're going to again come back to this, and this is something that I touched on yesterday, this judgment about the shadow self, that part of ourself that we don't want to look at. We're going to look at what happens when we devalue the personal relative to the spiritual or the transcendent. And I'll explain these terms, they're a bit complicated. And the last one, this delusion of attainment or enlightenment. So we'll plow on because I'm mindful of time. So I touched on this yesterday, this idea that we have this part of ourselves that we don't like to look at, that we don't like to see, that we uh, hide from ourselves, hide from others, especially because we're spiritual people. We're good spiritual people. We're good Buddhists. We don't like to have this idea that we might be a complicated person. We just like to keep it simple. I'm a spiritual person. I'm a good person. I'm a Buddhist. I don't have these problems, do I? I don't have these parts of myself that aren't integrated authentically into my life. And this is that shadow, that shadow that, we, that follows us around, that, that maybe isn't as light or sunshiny as we would like it to be, that this part of ourself that might get angry from time to time, or that might, uh, uh, that might do things that are against the precepts, or might not be the kind of person that we project to the outside world. This idea that spiritual people shouldn't have negative emotions, feelings, thoughts, or desires. Negative, even this word negative is kind of um, not very helpful. We hide and repress perceived undesirable qualities. This does relate very closely to the experience of shame and a fear of exposure, um, a sense of not being worthy, which is what a lot of people feel, and a fear of losing control. This inability to acknowledge and accept our whole self. And of course, this means we simply can't integrate the work that we do inside ourselves and this outside performance of ourself, our spiritual self. This leads to self-deception, hypocrisy, cognitive dissonance, and sometimes it will lead to anger or rage. And as I talked about yesterday, this is a missed opportunity for growth on the spiritual path. And the problem is, it performs this idealized version of spirituality. So we'll just look at a few slides. Oh, looks like we're just going to be stuck in this loop, maybe. Oh, there we go. So this is, uh, this is an image that I showed yesterday. And yesterday I had my Buddhist face and my authentic feelings or something like that on where these labels are. But this was the original image that I found on the internet once. And I think it's useful because um, you, could, you could add any label to these situations and it would work for spiritual bypassing. And so we have this, 
I, I guess with sexual desire especially, it's something that is private and is something that we're conditioned to keep secret. Uh, maybe there's some shame around the, uh, our sexuality, our sexual orientation, the things that we enjoy or desire. Um, and society reinforces that all the time. And so I want to make this analogy here between that kind of sexual repression and uh, a spiritual kind of repression that we do. So it might not, it might be partially around sexual desire, it might be around uh, other forms of desire like food or entertainment or anything like that. Or it could be around things like anger or resentment or greed. Um, and, and these things are the kinds of things that we like to hide from our spiritual companions or hide from our teachers, hide from ourselves. And of course, that creates this problem because we have this version of ourself that we project to the world and we have this other version inside of us that doesn't relate, that doesn't, um, doesn't get let out. And because of how we're taught to think about these things, often in spiritual circles, that you know, these things are defilements, they're negative, they're um, problematic, they're unwholesome, they're unskillful, then we start to kind of create a monster in our mind out of them. And they, they can become a monster too because repression sometimes makes these things grow even stronger. You're sitting there meditating and you think, oh, I'd love to have a piece of chocolate cake. And you think, oh no, I shouldn't have, I don't deserve chocolate cake. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worthy of chocolate cake. Plus I'm meditating, I should meditate harder. Oh, but the chocolate cake, the chocolate cake, the chocolate cake. And then this thing, which, which is just a small thing can become this big, huge desire in your mind and overwhelm you. And then the next thing you know, you're getting up, you're going to the fridge and grabbing the chocolate cake. And uh, oh, there's another one. There's, there's something about the way this works that when we repress things, they'll come out somewhere eventually. And there's something about the spiritual path that doesn't allow us to see these parts of ourselves as spiritual that there is sexual desire, that there is greed or there is anger or, or whatever, that there's something that shouldn't be talked about or we shouldn't, um, shouldn't let out because we've perceived it as a kind of monster. The problem is though, that people end up putting on this spiritual face. In, in Theravada monasteries, uh, some people call this the Ajahn face. So it's the face that people show to the Ajahn, so the teachers, the senior monks. And so you often see people come in and they'll be very, very pious, you know, they'll be very kind and, and nothing's too much of a hassle for the, for the Ajahn to, to do to, towards the Ajahn. But then you see them turn around and yell at the lay people or yell at their children and be mean. And you kind of think, huh. Oh. And this person, it's not an authentic integration of self. They're one person towards other people and a different person to other people. So if they think of themselves in that spiritual context, oh, this is who I am, but they can't see themselves in that other person who's like, Arr, then there's a problem there. They're only identifying with the positive. They're only identifying with the idealized version of themselves, the idealized version of their spiritual self. They're not identifying with this angry person over here, but that's the person that they need to identify with. They need to see this is part of me. This is how I behave. This is something that affects other people and myself. And then they need to recognize this is a drawback. This is a problem. This is something that I should let go of. And they're only going to be able to do that if they can authentically see with clarity, that part of themselves. If that part of them, that angry person, isn't acknowledged or isn't uh, a part of their spiritual journey, then they're not going to make any progress. 
because they're only identifying with this fantasized version, which is a performance of spiritual self. I hope that makes sense. And so we all have this work to do, identifying these parts of ourselves that we hide from ourselves and others. And this is what really mindfulness is, is for. And clear comprehension is for, is to see how we behave in, in our in internal space and in certain situations. And, I, and to understand, to know really clearly. Similarly, Anyone who's on social media can identify with this fully curated and fake online persona where you're always happy, always smiling, always doing wonderful, good things. But then your real self, your authentic self, is that person that you hide. You make posts saying how wonderful your day has been or, hey, look at this wonderful meal I ate. You don't say, I'm feeling really depressed and lonely, or you don't show the, um, the act of washing the dishes, right? There's parts of ourselves that we share. There's parts of ourselves that we hide. And when we are thinking about our spiritual life, we actually need to see both parts of these as being important. We need to see these, uh, these sides of ourselves as being us, not trying to hide parts of ourselves, not trying to fake ourselves. One important reason for this is because otherwise we are going to end up incredibly hypocritical. So here on the left, we have this messed up human painted by Picasso uh, from Guernica. And on the right, we have someone advising others as if they were the Buddha. So this is something that I'm really conscious of, especially since I became a monk, this, this idea that, uh, uh, you know, just because you have the robes on, that you're somehow perfect, that, you know, people, when they, when they come to me with a problem, they're often projecting a lot of stuff onto me as a monk. And that this happens to a lot of monastics and any spiritual teacher, actually, or any authority figure, that they will see the, the monks as being kind of much further ahead on the spiritual path than they are. But the truth is, we're just the same as you. We're just trying to work it out. We're still struggling with the spiritual path. We're still making progress. And an expert is just someone who started before you did. And so we, we have uh, more time as, as monks and nuns to work with the spiritual path. But then you also see how, <laughs> how messed up your life is, you know, because you have more time to see it. You sit in meditation and you think, oh, I've got so much more work to do. And this is something that I realized after going to, into the monastery and spending much more time with my, myself and my thoughts and seeing just how hard it is to work with the mind and control the mind, that um, it's not an easy journey and it doesn't get easier just because you wear the robes. It's a long path and there's a lot to work out. There's all these habits, there's all these secret parts of the mind. And I do believe I have made progress on the spiritual path. I think anyone who's sincere, whether they're in robes or whether they're not in robes, whether they're working, whether they're a mum, whether they're, uh, you know, whatever your career, whatever your way of life is, you know, if you've got an, a sincere desire to practice the spiritual path, you will make progress, but it's not gonna be fast, it's gonna be slow. And that's what we saw yesterday with those slides about the spiritual path being messy. But the important thing is we need, oops, we need to be aware if we're saying that we're spiritual, we need to make sure that these things actually show up in our life. And that means in all our life, all parts of our life, not just while we're at the temple, not just while we're at the monastery, not just when we're doing um, a spiritual performance. And so one of the things that uh, I'm aware of is 
it's very easy just to sit on the cushion and practice metta and send, chant the metta sutra and send love to all living beings. And then once you get off the, the cushion, that's when your practice actually matters. Because that's when you're going to need that love, when you interact with humans, yeah? And so if you get up off the cushion or you done your meditation practice that morning, you go and you're mean to the bus driver or you shout at your partner or you get angry with uh, your coworker. That's where your spirituality needs to show up. That's where it really matters. That's where you're meant to be using your spirituality. It shouldn't be separate from that time that you spend on the cushion. Your spirituality needs to show up somewhere in your life. Otherwise, it's not a spiritual practice. There's much more I could say about that, but I'm conscious of time. Um, actually, no, I would just say a bit more um, because, because this, this is the big problem that we have in our practice is that we don't, we don't recognize when we're hypocritical. We don't recognize when we're not rising to the, uh, at the, the level that we should if we've taken on a spiritual practice. Um, so there's one thing to have this idealized version of, of ourself as a spiritual practitioner, but it's another thing to not even try to, to get to a point where we are that. You know, we, we, we need to make effort to be spiritual. We need to make effort. There has to be this direction of trying. We need to push ourselves a little bit so that that spiritual part of ourself that lives in the privacy of our mind, privacy of our homes, comes out into the world somehow. So there has to be this effort. Otherwise, it's not going to matter um, because the time that you spend on the cushion is 10 minutes a day, one hour a week or something like that. But the time that we spend in the world, that's where we need to rely upon our ethics. That's where we need to rely upon things like generosity, kindness, all of those spiritual things. One of the big problems I'll talk about in a little while is that we narrow the spiritual path to mindfulness or meditation. And we think that's what it means to be a spiritual person, but we forget about all the other time when we're not sitting on the cushion. But what this does essentially is creates what's, what's known as a cognitive dissonance, this gap between the way that we perceive ourselves and what's actually happening. And this is an important um, thing to be aware of. So it's a mental conflict. When our beliefs are contradicted by new information, and apparently there's some sort of response in the brain where there's a, like a distress response. The alarms go off and we feel threatened. We feel uh, like we have this kind of fragile ego that gets shut down and we, we can't cope with this idea that maybe we're not just as we thought we were. And cognitive dissonance is, is something that's um, really common. And I see it all the time in my practice with other people. Uh, so even just the other day, I had someone call me up and they told me that they were stoned. So that, um, stoned, like they'd smoked some mar marijuana. And they called me up and they, they told me that they were stoned. And then they're saying, oh, look, I just want some clarity in my life. You know, I just want to get really good meditation and good insight. I want to see things really clearly. And it's like, like you're actually stoned at the moment. Like, how are you going to do that? You know, and they were asking me, and they were asking me um, to help them. And I was kind of like, well, maybe don't get stoned. Like, you know, if you want to see things clearly, don't get stoned. And he reacted badly. And he was like, oh, you're just judging me and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, why would you call a monk? to talk about your spiritual practice while stoned and, and think that that was going to be something which couldn't be um, integrated, that 
you know, there's this thing that he's talking about. He just wanted to talk about his meditation practice, but he couldn't see that his meditation practice was going to be related to all the things that he was doing, like getting stoned. So this is how sometimes it is for people. They can't see how their life affects their meditation. They can't see how their, um, uh, their, their way of being affects their, um, their interaction with others, all sorts of things. People have these kind of almost like a disability, this disconnect between the way they see themselves and the way they think things are. Oh, sorry, the, the way the world is. Uh, another example is um, when there's a part of ourself that might say something that's racist or sexist or homophobic, and we can't see that as being uh, racist or sexist or homophobic, and we can't see ourselves as other people would see us. So this is also a kind of cognitive dissonance. And then when we look in the mirror, maybe we see things slightly differently. If we look and if we see ourselves as we really are. And so this, this is um, important because, as I said before, we have this idea of ourselves as being a good person. And this is the most dangerous self view to have in a way. I'm a good person. I'm a spiritual person. I'm a Buddhist. How could I do anything wrong? I'm a good person. I'm a Buddhist. Isn't that enough? Does that disqualify our bad actions? It doesn't, but we have this view of ourselves. And sometimes it's really hard for people to see that they can do something that harms others. Um, a good example is a teacher who uh, might uh, seduce their students or abuse their students or use spirituality in a way that hurts or harms others. And I'm a teacher, I'm a Buddhist teacher. I'm using wisdom, I'm, sh I'm shaking the, the Dharma out of them. I'm showing them the true way. You know, there's this cognitive dissonance. And this is, the, this is what's been seen by a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of Buddhists who recognize these kinds of behaviors in others, that there's this gap between the way that a spiritual person might perceive their, their thoughts and their actions and their speech and how they are in, the, in, in reality. And so we need to be very careful of this self-view, this conceit of superiority, this spiritual smugness that gets in the way of seeing who we really are. And we need to understand that just because we're spiritual doesn't mean that we don't have problems that we need to work on, doesn't uh, mean that we can't do actions that harm others. So this is something um, I really wanted to highlight that, that we need to be aware that our spirituality doesn't confer any kind of magic powers. And spiritual people can also be very messed up and can harm others. Okay, got to keep moving. So somewhat related is this idea of a lopsided spiritual development. So lopsided means unequal or uneven. Often this is because of a very narrow knowledge of the spiritual path. Uh, this is something I encounter all the time. Some people who will be at meditation classes or parts of uh, meditation groups or sanghas will only know one sutta. They'll only know the Satipatthana sutta. And they think that this is all there is to know. But there's a lot that's not in the Satipatthana Sutta. So, yeah, it might not be the whole path. It might just be a part of the path. But they're only seeing this very narrow version. Often we see this, that mindfulness is valued over ethics ethical speech or relationships, that mindfulness will become sort of fetishized in the spiritual community, but it might not be supported by other aspects of the path. Remember that uh, samasati is just one factor of the Eightfold Noble Path. 
it's not the entire path. It's just one small part. It's an important part, but if it's misused or misunderstood, then it might not help. What happens is that people can become um, interested in cognitive and analytical aspects of spirituality, like dependent origination, for example, or the higher states of um, enlightenment, but they might neglect emotional intelligence, like being nice to someone, or being kind, being generous. And this is something that I often see in Western communities. They, they devalue um, things that are associated with traditional Buddhists, such as devotion, faith, uh, ritual, and they kind of look down upon them. Uh, there's a slightly racist thing that might be happening here, or a cultural bias against Asian culture that, you know, Western Westerners might have the truth and the the intelligence that uh, is lacking in other areas, you know. And this, of course, is wrong. And uh, they miss out on an incredible aspect of the spiritual path because of this lopsided spiritual view. Often this is people with only academic knowledge, <laughs> completely theoretical knowledge, which they value over real experiences and subjective knowledge. You see this often people will tell me what, what being a monk is like, and they've never been a monk or never visited a monastery. And you think, hmm, okay. Or they'll tell you what it means for someone to be enlightened and they haven't really got there themselves. Or they'll tell you what a spiritual person should be like um, that should be this kind of theoretical idealized version. So the problem, of course, is that this means that people's spiritual life remains very fragmented, uneven, and unintegrated, just like I was talking about before, you know, that you can sit on the cushion and have a good meditation experience, but then your spirituality is left behind, it's not taken out into the world, and you don't see the rest of your life as being part of your spiritual practice. I've noticed that, that people who have this lopsided spiritual development often have very rigid views, fixed views about what spirituality is and what the right way to do something is. And that there are certain things that are right and there's certain things that are wrong. And it's very fixed, it's very black and white, it's not very gray. Often it's not very sophisticated, it's very uneven. And because their spirituality isn't integrated, they have poor communication, bad relationships and interactions with others because their spiritual practice is just a theoretical thing. All of these things should improve as you go along the spiritual path, hopefully. And of course, they're like this frustrated perfectionist. They have a perfect plan, a perfect spiritual plan, but life and reality is messy and keeps on getting in the way. So here, here is a photograph that kind of relates to that plan, uh, a photograph, uh, sorry, an animation slide. So he, here we have, I think it is Jerry or Tom, I can't remember the name of, I guess it would be Tom the cat, with a match, match of meditation, ready to light the dynamite of self and probably thinks that he's going to explode suffering, samsara, attachment, ego. But of course, he's going to blow himself up as well. And you might think back to yesterday and that analogy of the snake, the wrong hold of the snake, and how sometimes grasping the teachings in a wrong way can actually cause more harm than good. So if you only use meditation um, you're not going to, uh, to allow for other things to help you along the spiritual path. For example, uh, if you want to get rid of yourself, practicing generosity or love and kindness is just as equal. And you're going to be doing more of that outside your meditation than you are in your meditation. So where are you going to put that emphasis on your spiritual path? Uh, you're going to just leave it on the cushion or are you going to take it into the world with you? So some of this 
relates to what they call emotional intelligence. And so these are, uh, this is a bit of a buzzword from the 90s, but this is something that um, Robert Masters talks about when he talks about spiritual bypassing, that people haven't got the self-awareness to see uh, how they're acting on the spiritual path. They, they can't see that developing these things are important. And there is, a, an, uh, just as in many parts of the world, an over-reliance upon the intellectual, an over-reliance upon... Um, upon academic or theory and not enough real world understanding. And so I like this one, it says, I just came out of emotional intelligence training and they taught me self-awareness as if that's something that can be taught. But this is, this is something that we are trying to do is actually develop this sense of seeing ourselves clearly. And so maybe emotional intelligence is one way to look at that. Mindfulness might be another way to look at that. Uh, talking with a friend, asking for feedback, talking to a therapist or whatever. But we need to kind of develop this way of seeing ourselves more clearly. Uh, here we have the same person. It's actually a, 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 a guy, apparently, um, this poor person who has become a meme for many, many spiritual memes. Uh, here you see this kind of disconnect their roommates are angry at him, actually, for not paying the rent, and but he's angry at them. So it's this misplaced kind of sense of uh, emotional harm happening to them, but not seeing that they've harmed others by not paying the rent. And I, I found this the other day, and I thought it was hilarious. You might be emotionally suffering and not even know it. <laughs> uh, for some reason, it really made me smile. So when we talk to people, sometimes um, we, as, as monastics, we see people really struggling to put this side of themselves forward, their best side forward. They want to be seen as, as a good spiritual practitioner. They don't want to show these flaws. But then other times people come to us and they, they have a lot of problems and they talk about their struggles. They talk about things that are not working for them. And I think that those people are in a better place than those people who think they're doing really well on the spiritual path, because even though they've got problems, they're aware of them and they're aware of needing to work on these things. Um, I remember hearing about some person who had decided that they were enlightened and they were kind of going around letting people know that they were enlightened and that they had made this attainment to awakening. And his wife heard about it. <laughs> and she was like, he's not enlightened. No way. The reason is she knew him, right? She sees him. She lives with him. There's nowhere for him to hide. But in his mind, he was able to, to hide you know, from himself. He was not able to see who he was in the relationship outside of his meditation practice. He didn't bring that part of himself to the picture that he presented to other people. And he told people that he was enlightened. And so this is the kind of danger that happens when we're not fully integrated. So if you want to know if someone's enlightened, you should ask their coworkers, ask their friends, ask their family, ask their, um, their parents. You know, these people, they see you you know, and we need to see ourselves also in an authentic way. All those parts of ourselves that we don't want to see, they're still us. You know, when we do our meditation practice, you might see that you identify with the good meditator, right? You know, when a good meditation has gone well, it's because you're a good meditator. When a meditation goes bad, is because those thoughts came at you. They're not your thoughts. They're things that are happening to you, right? You see the difference. We take pride in the good. We like the praise. We like the good feelings. We like the positivity. And the other stuff doesn't belong to us. So we need to reconcile this. We need to understand that these things are also part of us. And it's okay. 
Just remember all of those people who see you clearly, your friends, your family, they see you and they still love you. So we need to see ourselves more clearly with love and kindness and compassion too. So I've been talking way too much. Let's have a breakout session. We're going to have a focus question and it's going to be about this debilitating judgment of our shadow self. So the question is, how can we avoid the pitfalls of self-deception, hypocrisy, cognitive dissonance in our spiritual practice? So how can we be authentic? How can we avoid these pitfalls of hypocrisy, cognitive dissonance? 